of all the things that we've learned in 2022 so far, I would argue the biggest lesson has been about embracing change. In fact, in our groups, we're working with the fantastic Coyote, who is a master at helping us to embrace change and go with it and stop trying to control things. Today's guest, Heather Hansen O'Neill, is an expert in change. She is the host of the From Fear to Fire podcast, and she's here to tell you change is the new normal. Join us to find out more. So Nectar Show, the So Nectar Show. You're invited, delighted to discover who you are. Anything is possible if you believe. So join us on this beautiful journey. So Nectar Show, So Nectar Show. Before we start this episode, I, Carrie Hummingbird, and I, Akeem Sami, want you to know that you are invited. You're invited to, to join, join Soul Nectar, Nectar Tribe. Tribe. If you like what you hear on Soul Nectar Show, you will love being in person with us in Soul Nectar Tribe. We invite you to check it out. First 30 days is free. Right now, go to CarrieHummingbird.com. K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com, forward slash membership, and sign up. We'll We'll see see you at at our our next tribe tribe gathering. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the big mystery beyond the veil, to those synchronistic moments that lead us inexorably to a deeper understanding of ourselves and the world around us and how we can make life more contextual and interesting um, when we actually focus on the things that we're trying to avoid and we, uh, we move through it in a new way. We can actually unlock a new understanding about life, which is delightful for me. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and I love these conversations. I have them week after week on the show here and I'm so grateful every time you join us to listen in and to be part of this conversation and of course would like to encourage you to also engage you know send some comments or some reviews and let us know what you're thinking as you listen to these episodes and uh, I really enjoy having you with us and I'm enjoying today actually also having our guest Heather Hansen O'Neill welcome Heather hi thanks great to be here Carrie So I'll tell you a little bit about Heather. Heather is an international speaker, author, adventurer, and entrepreneur, using her action-packed experience to fire up audiences. She stimulates vibrant energy, focus, and action for those who want to collaborate effectively, lead change, and achieve massive results. And so she does some speaking to help companies and individuals break through fears, judgments, and blocks to reach sales and leadership success. And she's in demand these days, you know, during these changing times to help people through those changes. She's the host of the From Fear to Fire podcast. I've been on that podcast and I'll put the link in the show notes. And she's got some awesome books out too. Find Your Fire book, Teams on Fire book, and a new release that's coming out. Where's the office moving today's leaders from what is to what can be? I love that. So Heather, tell us a little bit about your own journey. How did you become such an expert in leading change? Oh, I don't know, maybe by going through a bunch of it. (laughs) So, you know, I've been on this journey for a very, very long time. Um, Very familiar with changing careers when my my passion of dancing for a living came crashing literally to a halt when I injured myself. Um, Going back to school, starting in sales and advertising, and then being coerced by an amazing mentor to start my own business. Like, 25 years ago and haven't looked back since because I am totally an entrepreneur at heart. I didn't even know it. And uh, I love, love, love what I do. Super happy about it. Yeah, I can understand you there. I I did a short stint in a corporation uh, in Silicon Valley, a couple different ones in my early career. And then as soon as I could break out with enough experience to work for myself, I was like, I'm out of (laughs) here. 
<laughs> I need to be on my own. I need to be my own boss. That's kind of unusual because a lot of people seem to be, um, just from what I've noticed, there's a, a lot more corporate people working for companies than there is entrepreneurs. And so when you work for companies, how how does that mesh? You know, How does your message reach them when they seem to have a different mentality about working? Well, it's really interesting. The, the main difference, I think, comes down to security. Like, where do we find, what are, what are our values, right? And so someone like, like you and I, who have gone off on our own and love being entrepreneurs, we probably value freedom more than security. And someone who decides to stay in the corporate world and either climb the ladder or, you know, figure out how to weave their skills into the bigger vision for the company, they probably have a little bit higher desire for security and um, maybe love the, uh, the idea of working together with the team more so than the fear that's attached to going off on your own, because that can be a little bit of a roller coaster for some people. It can be a roller coaster for you and I too. Well, yeah. We're just okay with roller coasters. Sometimes we throw our hands up in the air and scream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe I was prepared for that by a childhood of moving around quite a bit. You know, I always had to go into a new town as a child and make new friends. And I got very good at spotting clicks and, you know, social dynamics and kind of figuring out where do I, where do I want to fit into this little example of, you know, social dynamic and how do I want to play here? And so I think that made me okay with moving around. And I don't know if that's the only ingredient, but it does feel like it has to do with belonging. Like I feel like um, if, if you, if you need to belong, like in a really big way, kind of being on your own might be scary. It definitely can. And for those entrepreneurs who have that desire to be on their own, to start something, to create something, to have that freedom, but have a strong sense of belonging, there's a really great, amazing community of entrepreneurs who help each other. So you're never really alone if you know where to look. Yeah. I mean, these podcasts are case in point, right? I mean, because I work for myself, you work for yourself, <clears throat> just about everybody else I interview works for themselves or would mm -hmm. like to, you know, <laughs> maybe right, they have right. a day job, but they do this on the side. And so there is that um, freedom of being able to speak your mind. And I know that some of my clients um, who work in corporate, they are not allowed really to post what they feel even on their social media. Like there's so mm -hmm. many guidelines and restrictions, or there's at least a fear of that, you know, a fear of being seen for what you actually think and feel um, on social media by your employer too. You know, it's really interesting that you bring that up because um, in the in the final revisions of Where's the Office, I was literally yesterday um, working on the chapter that has to do with leaders that are leaders of the future that are doing things differently within corporations to encourage uh, their people to be more individuals and to embrace who they are and to incorporate their uniqueness, their gifts into what they do for the company. Uh, and so it is new. I will tell you that you're right, that that is probably seen a lot right now, but where we're helping companies is to be able to have the type of leadership that communicates well, but also fosters that independence, especially when some of your leading is going to continue to be not in an office. You know, yeah, because you're, be people have to self-manage at that point. And mm -hmm. so it's less about, I saw some graph the other day and in, in like the shift in business is going to be going away from like micromanaging people and expecting them to sit in their desk for like 10 hours a day and, and focus somehow their brains on whatever they're doing, which is we yeah. all know from a neuroscience perspective is like ridiculous. It doesn't work um, to, you know, project-based and, you know, in project-based, it's like, well, just use your expertise and talents and do it whatever way you need to do it in order to deliver it on time with quality and we're fine. We don't need to monitor you and what you're doing with every single moment of your day. You know, it's, you do what you need to do to be productive and be an adult and then deliver the content and we'll be happy, right? 
Exactly. But it requires more trust from everyone, especially the leaders. Yeah. So that, that's a big, like, so being a leader in this time requires a lot of us, doesn't it? It requires us to be able to be trusting individuals, to have discernment, to know, like, if we're being told the truth or not, and also to be able to lead effectively if somebody is sort of falling down on their on the new paradigm, right? If they're working at home, but they're not really um, able to do it, maybe it's not a matter of dishonesty. Maybe it's just a matter of needing some new tools and structures. Exactly. Oh, so, so true. I mean, we need to help people. We've always needed to, to be there and provide the tools, the strategies, the tips, the, you know, the communication. And now we're just getting real clarity on what that's going to look like. And it will look very different than it has in the past. So but isn't know, that everything we talk about? Everything. It's very different. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, you know, I just have this theory that being a parent prepares you to be a really good leader. And I wonder, like, for your experience of being a mom, how has that really shaped your understanding of leading others? Oh, my goodness. It's been an unbelievable training ground, a breeding ground for insanity, but training ground. So I have, I have three amazing sons, and they're 18 months apart. Like, literally, my twins were born 18 months after my oldest. So, and they're all very different. Even though my twins are identical, their personalities are really different. So it's been um, an amazing science experiment, we'll call it, to understanding how to lead or parent, um, interact with people that have very different needs, very different desires, very different skills, and how to do it so that everyone is optimized, right? Everyone is getting what they need, even if it's a little different than the person next to them. And so this, uh, this difference between fair and equal Right. You know, so it doesn't always have to be equal, but it has to be fair. Right. So it has been, you know, it's so funny that you bring that up. It's been uh, amazing for me to be able to take what I've learned in that arena and trans translate it. Yeah, I think that it's um, what it teaches you up close and personal that people are are not cookie cutter, you know, and that they're all different. And that's why these corporate cookie cutter models, they don't really work because people lose, if they're, you know, people are nuanced, you know, they have their own unique drives. They have things that motivate them. They have interests and they also have fears and they have things that hold them back. Right. So, you know, people might get into a profession where they did it because they felt it might be safe, but then actually over time, they're really depressed because it's not really the best thing for them. It's not really what they want to be doing, but they're now they're in it. So they're afraid to move. And so leadership, I believe, is about seeing that in the person and saying, you know what, you need to stretch your wings and you need to grow. And I'm inviting you into this other role where you'll, like for me, I was behind a desk. Imagine this. I was behind a desk doing t technical writing, AP references for programmers for like, you know, 20 years. Okay. <laughs> like I was behind a desk at the corporate job for five years doing that, that kind of thing hidden away, locked away in an office, not interacting with people. Are you serious? That is you not appropriate for me. Horrible for you. <laughs> it was so depressing. <laughs> and you know, the only way I got through it was because I have, I have this knack for being able to make everything interesting. Like I can make the most boring thing interesting. So I did that, you know, and I made good money, but I was like, I can't keep doing this. And by the time I was nearing the end of that stint of that work, that kind of work, I was so I had the cushiest job. I was working, you know, from home for a California company. I was consulting, but I was actually their employee, you know, so I was getting employees mm -hmm. and I was getting paid full time and I could barely make myself do an hour a day. That's how depressed I was. I was like, I can't oh, yeah. even do this one minute more. It's too much. And so people, that's why people get so depressed and drink, right? Is that they're in the wrong position. Right. And, and it is so true. And we have to be able to, to not wait until we are so tragically uncomfortable to make a change. And like, that's one of the things, and I say that because that's, the, that's human nature, right? If we're doing something and it's okay, or we're in a relationship and it's okay, you're paying most of your bills and you're okay. Like if when things are okay and you're not happy, but you're okay, you don't make a change, right? When do you make a change? 
when you're tragically unhappy, when something dramatic happens, when somebody else fires you from a job that you hated but didn't want to quit, right? So, so my, my call out to anyone out there who is not exquisitely happy is to look at it. You know, don't wait until you are at a place where you absolutely can't do anything else but change. Constantly evolve and look at who you are and who you want to be and, you know, what you were meant to be. And, and when you look at that, you're taking right actions, you're making right decisions every day toward a better you, which is better serving. Yeah. And a lot of people avoid that because of fear, right? So like, I don't want to lose this job because it makes a lot of money. I don't know what else I would do if I wasn't doing this thing and it's too late to change because I'm mid-career and like the whole conversation. Oh, yeah. I want to say I threw it all up in the air and I was like, house, you know, deck of cards, <laughs> cards, you know, like I just said, I can't, whatever it is, I'm out. Like I'm out of the marriage. I'm out of the, you know, and so that's when the midlife crisis, I think I really feel that midlife crisis is a sign of people that have gone like, I've done this thing too long that I thought I had to do. And I cannot be false to myself any longer. That's what I believe that whole thing is. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really, it, you know, I think about it, I'm looking at your background with the butterflies, right? And, and it is that, that moment where you're like busting out of the cocoon that you just can't, you can't hold back any longer. That's when you become fully, you know, like you say, talk about the essence when we started this, right? The essence of, of, of who you're supposed to be. You know, it's been there. It's always been there. Um, maybe you didn't, you couldn't hear it or you couldn't see it because it was covered. It was blocked by fears, by judgments, by assumptions, by all of these things that keep us from our authentic true self you know i love to see when people do what you did and are able to you know just let it go and become just become yeah become exactly yeah. it's interesting that i notice um you know bitterness and re resentment and anger and hatred and all of those signs of resistance to change yeah. that people that are in that space and I can't seem to move past it is sad to me because it's on the other side of letting go of whatever it is you were so angry about that you can actually grow into a more authentic you and then your life can blossom too so rather than be upset with people who who left and went like you know what this isn't working and found their way and are blossoming and thriving rather than like keeping on looking at that and trying to tear it apart like just go, wow, I could do that too. What's stopping me from doing that to, for myself? Why am I in a stuck in a rut, you know, focused on somebody else's success when, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, mm -hmm. there's different ways to deal with change. Talk a lot about that a little bit because right. people are thrust into change right now, whether they want to be or not. The, the most, the most consistent thing in anyone's future right now is change. <laughs> so you could look at it that way. If you want to look at how to gain more consistency, wrap your head and your heart around change, because that is the new normal. You know, everything is, everything changes. And it's always been that way. We've just been fighting it. So how can we embrace change? How can we use it to become more resilient beings? How can we use change to demonstrate by example for people how to make a real meaningful difference in the world? When you look at that that bigger picture. So I talk a lot about change, you know, and people reside in different places on what I call the change spectrum. And some people are naturally very drawn to change. They may, they may be able to be pretty good at it. Like I, I create change in my life on purpose. I'm one of those people, but there are other people on like maybe the other end of the spectrum who are hugely resistant to change, no matter how positive the change may be. And everybody resides at some point on the spectrum. Everybody needs to kind of look at where am I naturally and allow for whatever resistance comes up to that. Don't like block yourself. Just allow, okay, I'm feeling a lot of resistance right now to this change. I'm just going to feel it. It's not the resistance. It's the amount of time 
that we spend in resistance that causes the problem. Once you, once you go past it, if you don't feel it fully and allow yourself to move through it, then you get stuck in it. You get stuck in it. You're constantly resisting. You're constantly fighting. You're, you know, why me? Why the, oh, woe is me. The world is against me. All of this stuff because you're, you're caught in the state of being stuck. But when you can allow that resistance, allow whatever emotion to come through you, then you'll be able to clear the space so that you can envision, well, how might this change serve me? How can I become better? I mean, what can I learn from this? What's the bigger vision of what this change is going to do for me, for my family, for my company, for this community? And so when you can start to move past it into those different types of questions, you'll be able to take better actions. And like I said before, which is all stems from making better choices. <laughs> yeah. And I think, it, you know, it, dealing with change effectively requires feeling everything, right? And moving through and re letting go of your expectations. You know, maybe you thought, well, I thought I was going to sign up for this job and I'd have a pension or mm -hmm. I thought it was death to us, to us part. And then you, you divorce me. And, you know, so whatever the things are, it, change happens. And on the other side of that change could be beauty if we let it right? And, and it's that embracing of the thing we say we don't want or the thing that is our biggest fear, that's actually turned into the hugest gold, right? I mean, on the other side of that embrace. Exactly. I mean, and, and recognize what we control. I think people get into a lot of trouble when they try to control the things and the people that are outside of their control. I mean, have you ever known someone. I mean, I, we've all done it from time to time when we're, we're thinking that we can make someone else be happy or we can cause someone else to change. We can motivate their change. Well, technically you cannot change another human being, but you can change how you think about them and the situation, how you feel about it and what you do as a result of it, the response to it. And, and when people hold fast to pandemics or the economy or the weather or another person's opinion and it causes them to uh, become infected with that negativity, that's when we get stuck. And we, we forget that we control how we respond to it. So just own that and everything else is going to be golden. Just own that. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it's funny how, um, I, I just switched my perspective and I stopped thinking that things were against me. And I started thinking, how is this for me? How is this the best thing that could have happened? Because I started switching from thinking the universe was like a scary, precarious place into the universe is actually supporting me to become my best and highest. And in order to become my best and highest, these changes need to take place. And so this is for me somehow. And if I can change my perception if I can let go of the eyes I was using to see it, right, I might find another truth that's more true. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's truths, there's things that are true up until now, and then things change. There are people I, I know in my life who up until now have not been fans of change, right? So they, they sort of like get an idea about who a person is, and they want to hang out in that idea forever, right? For me, that doesn't work because I'm an evolutionist. So I'm constantly evolving. And so it just, it, it, it's like this friction, you know, between people that want to still see you the same way. And then the fact that you know you're an evolutionist and you're never the same. Like I might have said something last year. This year I go, you know what? I saw it a different way now. Now I'm saying it this way because this is more true. And some people say, oh, that's gaslighting. It's like, no, that's, that's changing your mind. That's like, going, you know what, I've just seen it differently now and now I'm, I'm in a new place with it. I've evolved. And I feel like humanity is being really encouraged to evolve yes. and stop getting stuck in old ideas and old projections and just like, first of all, also stay in your own lane. You know, that's a really good one too. <laughs> stay <laughs> in your own lane. And if you see something that bothers you out there, isn't that more about you, Heather? Well, okay, there are 14 things that I, I know, want to right? Express about what you just said. So, like, so let's start with um, stay in your own lane, right? So there are things that, that are literally none of your business and you need to just do your thing and, and make sure you're taking right actions based on your, your truth, your values, um, your belief system. And then there are other things that are, that are bigger that you're meant to impact, 
that you, based upon your unique gifts, based upon the, the way that you see the world and, and how you can, um, in your actions, by example, make change. And so there, there's two kind of different things there. It sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but it, 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 you have to know yourself. You have to know you, your authentic self, what you believe in. And I am saying belief a couple of times on purpose because I spend a lot of time. I don't know if you were able to see my most recent TED talk on it, but on beliefs. And it has to do with the fact that we believe that um, our beliefs are fact and that they are ours and that they are, you know, they're just are, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. That's just who I am. But see, that's not true <laughs> because beliefs are opinions. And when I believe really strongly that we have to, once we become conscious of our beliefs, we become aware of them, we can look at them and we can ask certain questions like, is this belief true? Is this belief mine or was it given to me by someone else? And is this belief serving me? And if you don't take the time to become aware of, to become conscious of your beliefs and ask those three questions, you won't know which ones are honestly yours that you believe very strongly. They're true. They're good. They're serving. Keep those <laughs> and then let go. Just literally let go of the beliefs that you've had, that you've perpetuated, that may have been passed down from generation to generation, creating bias and, and violence and prejudice. We have the power to change our beliefs once we become aware of them. Yes, I could not agree with you more. Um, you know, I am a student of the of the Toltec teachings and um, Don Miguel Ruiz, you know, in the Four Agreements. And uh, actually, I think uh, Miguel Jr. wrote the book, um, The Five Levels of Attachment. He talks about this idea of like how people are willing to basically, at the very highest level of attachment to ideas, people will kill each other over those ideas. Mm -hmm. But they're just ideas. They are simply ideas. They're not even, it's not like there's a tiger beating down your door trying to eat you alive. But you might think there is because of your some of the attachment to some of these ideas that people have. And mm -hmm. then they're willing to just destroy each other over these ideas. And and these ideas, some of them are historical, like you talked about. And some of them are actually based in fear, right? And they're not even true. It's so true. It's so true. And it is, when you were talking about evolving, it is literally one of the, the fastest, best ways to evolve into who you're meant to be is by becoming aware, just becoming conscious of uh, your surroundings, becoming conscious, especially of you and your beliefs. And that will get you to that place of being able to spread your, your butterfly wings. You know, this is why I think being triggered is a good thing. I'm actually mm -hmm. not anti-trigger anymore. I used to be like, oh, don't trigger me. Oh, it's out, you're hurting me. <laughs> now I'm like, go ahead, please try. Because that way I know where my triggers are. And because if, if I find the trigger, I find another belief. And I can look at that belief and go, huh, well, well think about this one today. I don't know if I want to keep that one or not. You know, and now it doesn't have power over me. I have power and it is just an idea. Yes. And that's the difference. Because when you let them like have power over you and get you all upset and everything else, you mm -hmm. know, there's always another way to look at that thing. Always. Turn always. it around. There's another way to look at it. You don't always have to be so upset. Exactly. And remember, if you're on this journey, that you may do the cha-cha, <laughs> meaning you may take some steps forward with this idea and then a step back, and that's okay. Because if you're releasing beliefs that don't serve you, if you don't replace that belief with something else, something will come up a trigger, and then you will cha-cha right back into your response that is your conditioned pattern, right? So just remember that it's part of it and you can um, make the make it more fun by, by dancing with it, but being aware of it and moving forward more than back. Yeah, and I find a really good tool for that is just slowing it down, right? Mm -hmm. One of my major things I'm here to help people with because it was my major life lesson is to move from impatience to patience because when you actually slow down 
things change. It's amazing how without the heat of the moment and the pressure and the I've got to respond and all of that that gets in arguments happen, it's like, wow, if I just slow down and I just hold myself, restrain myself long enough to be still, to breathe, to, to get my ner nervous system regulated again, like, okay, I'm, I'm safe, get out of my reptilian brain, <laughs> back into my heart. It's like usually I'll see some different side. All my heart opens, all of a sudden I'm looking at it differently. I'm understanding the other person's position a little bit more. I'm understanding my own reaction and why that was. And I'm comforting that part of me that got upset. And it's like, okay, well, then I'm, I'm identifying what's, what silly little belief got you upset. It's just that spaciousness, right? And we're, we I need to it. slow down, don't we? The power of the pause, you know, for, for those who are uh, impetuous by nature, like I am, it is incredibly powerful to honor the pause and the breath. And um, coming from the dance world, I, I call it coming back to body. My body tells me what I need. My body can heal me. My body will be able with the breathing, the heart beating, uh, can regulate me. And when I'm frantic, when I'm in panic, I'm not in my body, right? I'm worrying, I'm regretting, I'm in the past in my mind, or I'm in the future in my mind. But you can breathe into your body. And that's the pause that is so incredibly powerful. Yeah, that power of the pause, it gives us that taste of timelessness. Yes. And that taste of timelessness is actually where our soul resides all the time. Mm -hmm. And this time space reality is an illusion that's a very convincing one. And it's not real. You know, it's not it's not as real as the timeless aspect of self that every single moment I'm able to access that expanse is a, such a blessing. And when I come to my life from that place, I feel so free that I don't need to engage in anything that's going to hook me into a smaller space. Right. It, it's a beautiful place. And that's why, you know, meditation, consciously spending just a little bit of time each day, starting your day, perhaps. I like to start and end my day because meditation for me has two different things, depending on what time of the day I do it. So in the morning, when I meditate, I get an incredible like download of creativity. And when I meditate, at in the evening, I feel that quiet peace. And I like both of them very much. <laughs> and I can't, like, if I'm not consciously in that space, it, it doesn't, it, I can't get the same things that I get when I'm like, okay. You know, even if it's for five, 10 minutes. Yeah, and that's willingness to, to slow down and stop firefighting. I think motherhood teaches you that. Yeah, yeah, it does. It just sometimes I, I, I had to learn the lesson. I don't know, a hundred, nine hundred times. Me too. <laughs> it feels really pressing. Those motherhood things. They feel yes. so pressing, and yet there is a way in which um, that muscle of restraint. Oh yeah, is so important, and it gets built up really strong in motherhood. It does. It certainly does. And it's an interesting place because I'm um, the mother of, they're, they're technically all adults now, two 18 year olds and a 20 year old. So, and the, the 18 year olds are going to be 19 soon. So it's, um, it's a different space to just be present and not try to guide unless requested. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting transition. I know we're, we're almost at the top of the time, but I would like you to touch on that a little bit because in my audience, there are a lot of mothers and this is a very tender time I'm experiencing, the release of my sons and mm -hmm. letting them be adults and letting them be off in the world and kind of not look, peering over their shoulder energetically all the time, right? Like kind no, of backing I love that. off. That's like a great visual, peering over their shoulder energetically. I totally used to do that. And, and I've really consciously pulled myself back from that because it's, it's not allowing space for them to 
learn on their own for them to make their own decisions. And so I think the biggest thing, if I were to give a suggestion for any of the moms out there is to breathe into non-attachment, meaning that you can tell your story, you can tell what you learned, you can tell what you heard, um, but you can't be attached to them actually taking the advice anymore. <laughs> you can't be attached to their decision, their outcome, their results, because they're adults now. You can still love them. You can still and should, you know, come from that loving, loving open space where they can come to you whenever they need you. But if you come from judgment and from trying to insert your opinion on things, your perspective on things, I think it's going to have an ending that you're not going to like very much. And they need it. They need to be able to cultivate the ability to know when they need help and when they're going to make their own mistakes. They have to do it just like you did, just like I did, right? Yeah. And I find myself exploring myself, any desire I have to reach out because both my sons are out of the house now. It's like, okay, Carrie, are you reaching out as a gift? Or are you reaching out because you're pulling? Because mm -hmm. you're wanting something from them for you. Oh, yeah. And, that's a good question. Oh, boy. It's like, oh, because <laughs> it is hard because you're so responsible for them for this whole time. And it's it's an immersion of responsibility. And it seems like it's never going to end. And, and then all of a sudden it ends. ends. Yeah, well, you know, not really. Right? But, <laughs> you know, but that level of it ends. You that know? level of it does. And then they're gone and they're like, well, I don't really need you. And so my, my kids are super independent. They don't need me. They're like, I'm good. And it's like, you don't need me even one little tiny bit? Like just this a little? Just, <laughs> you just lead me this much? You know, just because I got a lot of other people that say I'm pretty good at mentoring. You just like this little, nope. So I was talking to one of my friends who's also a client and she said, what we need to do is we need to just trade children because <laughs> they, we are all really good at, at, you know, at being coaches, mentors, guides, right? But maybe not to our own kids yeah. in situations. We just trade for the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That sounds good. Maybe that's our new model. You know, that's, that's probably how the old tribes were built, right? Is because they know they want some help, but they're just... They have to also develop their own pride in themselves. And it's kind of feels like it might be smacking against their pride to come to mom. It's like, well, no, I need to solve this myself. It's true. They do need to solve it themselves, especially with the boys, right? So it's just interesting. I Thank you for sharing your perspective on that. I knew it would be juicy. Yeah. <laughs> I always so, love this. We don't know where we're going to go. <laughs> no, there was, it was kind of all over the map, but hopefully this was really good for people. I, I think that, you know, um, we're being encouraged to be sovereign beings. And as moms, that includes a whole lot of different threads. And we covered a lot of those threads in this call together. We have certainly. It's always so cool to see where, you know, if you're open to it, where things can go, right? Exactly. And without an agenda, because we just don't have any ever on this show. We just never know where it's going to go. I let spirit lead. So um, thanks for coming on the show. I wanted to give you an opportunity to share with us how can people um, get started working with you. I know they can tune into your From Fear to Fire podcast. Again, I will put a link in the show notes to my episode on that. It was Excellent. Wonderful. It was a great one. And it was good. Everyone who loves you will know it's going to be good. So listen to that. Yes, From Fear to Fire podcast. You can go to my website, heatherhansononeal.com. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can check out the TED Talk. You can just go to TED and put in Heather Hanson O'Neill and you'll get two of them. I've done two TED Talks and I am always open if anyone has any questions i'm an i'm an open book you can reach out at any time i love to help beautiful i love that congratulations on your ted talks too by the way that's awesome okay so we are at the point in the show where i'm going to make that request to everybody please like subscribe share follow whatever the words are get engaged and share this podcast out with anybody that you feel would really benefit from this um, this episode with the insights that were shared and um, and give us a, you know a review because that's important that's just how people find the engines know it's it's serving people is when they engage with it so we'd love for you to engage and if you put a comment in there Heather and I will see it and we will get back to you we will answer that that question so thanks a lot for tuning in and I'm going to give kisses now would you like to join me in giving everybody kisses mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, here they come, people. 
<laughs> I got to give somebody kisses, okay? My boys don't want them anymore, so you guys get them. They what just got want? some of those kisses you just sent out into the ether. <laughs> <laughs> They're good kisses. <laughs> oh, enjoy your kisses, everybody, this weekend, and have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now. Bye-bye. If you found even one gold nugget in this episode of Soul Nectar Show, will you do us a favor? Will you subscribe, like, and share this episode? Maybe even write a comment and let us know what you thought about it. We really, really want to engage with you at a much deeper level. Let's be part of community together. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. To dive in deeper to nourishing conversation, visit soulnectar.show. Soul Nectar Show. Awaken the Soul Nectar Show. Take a sip from the drip of nectar from the source of who you are.